Welcome to the Versus History Podcast with your hosts, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, Connell Smith and Elliot Watson. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Versus History Podcast. It's me, your host as usual, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, on behalf of the editors, Connell and Elliot and me. Today we're joined by Barry Cooper. And Barry is here to talk to us all about Japanese print art. I know very little about it. He knows a lot. Fortunately, that's why he's here. But Barry, before you talk to us about Japanese print art, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you became so interested in, in the history of Japanese print art? Over to well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm a school teacher by trade. Uh, so I'm a school principal now opening a school here in, in Madrid uh, called the Global College, uh, which is an IBDP only school. Uh, so we just do 16 to 18 year olds. Uh, but before I was here, I was uh, overseas in China um, and some very good, it's a very long convoluted story, but it's a good one. Uh, and a really good friend who's an architect um, and his wife is an archivist um, uh, in uh, Live in the Hague. And one year they gave me uh, a small Japanese print, tiny little thing. It was um, out of a small mature house. Um, it was uh, kind of a popular modern version of uh, something quite old. And I thought, this is pretty cool. I like this. And then uh, we ended up moving to Shanghai uh, to help open a school there. And uh, my wife and I uh, love traveling. And so our friends were in Japan because he uh, researches uh, J- Japan, Japanese architecture. And we went over and I started to see what the print was trying to show me about these traditional Japanese architecture. Uh, and I started to love it. So I started to dig into it and dig into it some more. And I, I, I have to confess, I'm a nerd for this stuff. I love it. Um, and it's uh, it's a, a real uh, pleasure just um, indulging in the history, uh, both the history of the artwork, but also what you then learn from the history uh, through the artwork. So I just find it fab. Thank you very, very much indeed. OK, then. So the first big question. Woodblock prints are a big topic. Could you structure that or break it down for us a little bit? Uh, so... Uh, the easiest way to, to break it down is just to think of it in three parts. So the first part is the really traditional stuff that we, uh, we, we're all seeing, you know, the Hokusai, you know, the Great Way, this kind of stuff. Um, and we refer to that as ukue-e, or, um, or just traditional Japanese woodblocks or Edo period. So Edo is the name for Tokyo before uh, the um, uh, the fall of the Tokugawa shogunate in uh, the uh, but before the Meiji Restoration. So it's uh, a period of time before modernism hit Japan. And this is where you have artists like Hiroshige and Hokusai, Otogawa, you know, Otogawa Hiroshige, really fantastic uh, masters of their craft. Once you get past this period, you get kind of, it lurches on a little bit, these traditional woodblock prints, until you get to around the 1920s. And there's a a guy called uh, Watanabe, um, uh, who comes up with a a new version, and he calls it Shinhanga. And Shinhanga is the, it's like the roaring 20s of woodblock prints. There's an explosion of of artistry. Uh, And, Watanabe is a is a, a, a publisher has a stable of artists who he just works and, and works with and they create just reams of this stuff and you you recognise it as a there's a real kind of 1920s style about it, um, but both of these styles the Edo period woodblock prints and the Shinhanga are both done in a really interesting way in which there is an artist. And there is someone who then carves the artwork onto uh, planes of wood. And there is a tracer and there is a printer. And there is there's a number of different people who do who, who take part in the process of creating these prints because a wood print is exactly what it says on the tin. It's, it's the Ronsil wood stain of, uh, of historical description. It's blocks of wood that you put paint on and you lay them over one another to create a piece of artwork. Once you get past Shinhanga, after the, um, the Second World War into the 1950s, you get something called uh, Sasakuhanga, uh, which is one artist doing the whole thing, 
which becomes really interesting because obviously they're either great painters or they're great carvers or they're great printers. They're not everything. So you have these interesting stylized kind of pieces of print work that then come out of that period. So that's the three um, sections that I would break it into. So before the 1920s, Edo period, um, and, and then late Meiji period prints, Shin Hanger from the 20s through to about the 50s, and then from the 1950s onwards, you have what we call Sasaku Hanger, which is one artist doing everything himself. Okay, thanks for that then, Barry. Okay, so next question, and forgive me, please, if I get the pronunciation wrong. So what makes Ukiyo-e so important to modern art? Uh, Absolutely everything. Um, This is the birth of modern art, uh, if I'm honest with you. It is um, the, uh, in the, in 1868, there was a revolution in Japan without, well, there were actually lots of shots fired, but it wasn't particularly bloody. And uh, the, this came on the back of the opening up of Japan in the 1850s. And during the 1850s, the 1860s, the 1870s, lots of goods from Japan found their way to Europe. And amongst those, were things like, you know, Hokusai's The Great Wave, you know, produced in the 1830s, famous image, fantastic, amazing piece of art, you know, lots of studies have been done on it. But not only were these, you know, small pieces of art sent to Europe, but sometimes things that people bought were wrapped in the prints or old prints or offcuts or failed prints. So this artwork came to Europe, not just as actual art, but also by mistake sometimes with people unwrapping pieces of China and instead of finding a piece of China and a piece of newspaper, they were finding a piece of China and an original Hokusai, which uh, today would be worth many, many thousands of dollars. At this point, you have um, Expressionism, uh, Impressionism, you have Van Gogh wandering around uh, the south of France, coming up with the palette that we all know today as one of the quintessential moments in art. Van Gogh and his brother actually dealt in this artwork. Uh, Monet, Tissot, all of these great artists of the period were inspired by uh, the, the woodblock prints that they saw coming from Japan. The colors that we see, uh, the shapes, the uh, pastoral scenes, they wove into their own work. And that's what you have today. The birth of modern art was unfortunately, I'm sorry to say, not European. It was Japanese. Learn something new every day. Thank you very much indeed, Barry. Okay, so the next question. So when does this form of art become Shin Hanger? So uh, Shin Hanger uh, comes after the uh, 1910, 1918. The first Shin Hanger is really around then when Watanabe uh, uh, Shozaburu starts um, printing or rather gets his stable of printers. So it's during the, you know, the First World War, but he really doesn't, it doesn't kick off until he finds a young artist called Kawase Hasler. And this is the guy that if you have ever seen a Japanese print, it's probably him. It's the, it's the name. It's the most, he's the most famous artist in the world that no one knows. Whenever you see a pastoral scene, a scene of a temple in the snow, it's either by him or it's been inspired by him. He is absolutely the master of his craft. He was a painter. So he didn't do the carving. He didn't do the tracing onto the wood blocks. What he did was he painted these beautiful pictures and then painted them in such a way that they were easy to carve into these separate blocks of wood, uh, either a five color, seven color, you know, maybe nine color prints uh, that people could churn out multiple copies. And Watanabe, what he understood was actually people are interested in this. And Hasue actually toured and did displays of his work. And Watanabe sent these works not only across Japan, where they were kind of seen as a bit parochial at times, but across America. And it was in America where they really took off and found found a home. 
Um, the uh, I mean, heyday of Shinhanga lasted really till the 1950s. These are two that I actually have. If you're watching this on the video, I, what I'm showing is two um, uh, pieces of work. One by Shiro on the left, which is a blue uh, picture of a garden in Tokyo, and one of uh, Sojoji Temple in the snow. And both of them are, when you look at them, they look rich and they look vivid and they look you know, just amazing pieces of work. But the reality is that there are only five color prints, only five different colors are in there. These are um, delicate, intricate, uh, but also really easy to reproduce. So not only is Shin Hanga, uh, a fascinating study in artistry and how to compose pictures and how to create new artwork, but it's also how to create this on a production line, how to turn what is a beautiful piece of work into something really entrepreneurial. This is what I find fascinating about Watanabe and his entrepreneurial nous uh, with this sudden interest in Japanese culture and Japanese art and Japanese visuals that he managed to ride that train and create what is still around today, a publishing house of great repute. Um, I could go on about Shinhanga probably all day. Um, and there are so many more artists as well to, to, to dig into. Um, and we, we tend to kind of start with these guys. Um, I think one of the things as well about that I find super fascinating about these pictures is that you're getting an original. So regardless of if you've got a Hokusai print or a, a Hathaway print or a Shiro print, uh, regardless of when it was done, what's happening is if it's done correctly, it's been taken from the original painting, it's been carved into wood, it's been printed by a master printer, and it's been signed by the artist or the publishing house. You're getting, and it's sometimes with the same kinds of inks that they're using in 1830 all the way up till today, there's, it's all there. The process hasn't changed you're getting the same thing. The painting, the original paintings from most of these are long since gone, they've been destroyed, they were destroyed in the process of making the woodblock prints. So the only thing that remains is the actual print. And you can recreate this again and again and again and again. And that's what you're getting, you're getting originality. So people, when they're spending 60, 70, 80, 90, hundred thousand dollars on you know, a Japanese print, what they're really spending money on is to say that it, it's old. But the print I had from the 1930s on my wall that was 100 years after Hokusai died of There the Great Way, or the print from 2015 on my wall, it was the same Hokusai print. It's exactly the same. Uh, and it's, it's a way of, of seeing and having that artist's original vision there on your wall without having to go and spend millions of dollars for an original. You're getting some of the greatest artwork ever produced for hundreds of dollars um, with a modern uh, reproduction in the same way as you would do if you took it out of Hokusai's hands in 1834. Well, a bargain at price to price. Thank you for that. Oh yeah, price. absolutely. Um, and there's, uh, there's actually, there's a guy at the moment who, um, if anyone's interested, looking up a guy called Dave Bull, um, who is a, a printmaker, he's actually a woodcarver, and he operates in uh, Asuka, uh, yeah, Asuka, uh, near the Sensoji Temple in the middle of Tokyo. And he, uh, what he does is he reproduces this, and he, the, he, there's a wonderful set of videos on YouTube where he goes through the process of recreating the Great Wave of Kanagawa, the famous one, the big wave crashing boats, mountain in the background. Um, and it's you know 13 hours long, this, this set of videos, and it's utterly fascinating. And you can go to his shop when Japan opens, you can visit him, I've met him, wonderful guy, mad as a box of frogs, but brilliant. Um, and uh, what he does is he goes through that and he recreates these uh, beautiful images by carving the wood himself and going through that whole process absolutely authentically in the same way they would have done it in in the 1830s. Both sold me. Thanks, Barry. Okay, the next question then, slightly similar to the previous one. So what therefore then is Sosuka Hanga? Sosuka Hanga is, um, it, this is the modern interpretation of, uh, of woodblock printing. So it is, uh, it comes out of the kind of 1950s, 1960s, 
all stem from the rebirth of Japan after the Second World War. And what you have is a, a modern twist or a modern interpretation of some classic uh, Japanese artistry or artistic tropes. So the, the, what tended to happen with the Edo period prints is they would, would print them in a series. So you would have 36 scenes of Mount Fuji, 100 views of the moon, uh, the 53 stations of the Tokaido Road, for example. Now, the Tokaido Road was a road between Tokyo and uh, Kyoto, uh, two most important cities in Japan, one would say. Now, along this incredibly long road were 53 way stations where people could stay, where people could you know, change horses, where people could you know, buy food. So back in the day, so 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, um, when you're walking this road, you're not uh, you know, getting in, in the bit of issue and kind of steaming along or taking the fast train, you're, you're walking. Um, if you're very, very wealthy, you might have a, have a horse. So along these stations, these, so there's a set of prints by Hiroshige um, called the 53 Stations of the Tokaido. And one of my favorite artists, um, I've actually got the, you know, if you're watching this on YouTube, these, uh, these are all prints. Everything I'm showing you is a, is a print that I have on, on my wall or in my collection um, uh, called uh, Junichiro Sukino. Uh, operating in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, decided to come up with his own 53 stations. And so he used very modern approaches, a modern stylizing. Um, and his own skills as a painter and as a carver and as a printer to then come up with these 53 images. So um, there's you know, the best example that I can find is there's a from the original Hiroshige is a a uh, picture called Shono, which is one of the stations. And it's a picture of a windswept, rainy hill, people slowly trudging up the hill, um, you know, trees blowing all over the place. It's really you know, moody and um, the, the rain feels like it's lashing down. Um, and uh, Sakino creates something similar, but the way he creates it is by showing a bar in the middle of a town, in the middle of the rain, in this very center of this picture, the eye of the duck, as David Lynch would call it, you, you've got this, this little silhouette that you think, you don't know what he's doing. Is he pouring a drink? Is he making some noodles? Is he pouring a beer? Who knows? Um, but it's right in the very center. And then all around it is just this lashing rain. You can really feel the darkness to it. But what I really love about this picture is if you look at the silhouettes, created by the rooftops within it, it actually mimics the great wave of Kanagawa. So he's not only is Sakino stealing the 53 stations idea, but he's also ripping this, this great you know, picture, this, you know, this, this framework of this great image that we all know and all understand, planting it in there subconsciously. So you're seeing this mountain in the background, these, the, the curves of the roof creating the waves, and then the little intersections creating the boats in the middle of the, the deluge. Uh, so I just, I find it absolutely fascinating. And, but with it, what you also see is you see modern um, art starting to impact Japanese art. So the art of Europe, then does an about face. So in the 18, uh, 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, Japanese art just slams into um, European art and people like Van Gogh and Monet wake up and go, crikey, okay, this is cool. We need to take this and use it. But the other way around, you then start to see artists like Rothko and um, Mondrian and all of these artists from the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, start to seep into what's happening with the art in Japan. And you see these elements then come through in, especially Sakino's work. You can see Rothko, you can see Mondrian. It's, it's a really interesting interplay. It's almost like uh, artistic tennis. You know, Japan served the ball at uh, Europe in the 1860s and Europe kind of returned it uh, like an Adal uh, backhand. Um, into the into the 1950s, 1960s. So it's a really, really cool interplay and, and a melding of the two cultures. Thank you very much indeed, Barry. Okay, the final question from me then is, it's sort of two halves. Why do you collect these pieces of work, as, as beautiful as they are? Well, we'll show raison d'etre. And if listeners or, or viewers like the sound of it, um, what could their next step be? What could they read? What could they see? How could they access more of this? 
wonderful yeah. Japanese print art. Absolutely. I mean, I I collect it because uh, I mean, it's what I was talking about earlier. It's the opportunity to have something modern, something new, something original, something historical, even if it's something that had been printed yesterday. It's still historical. It's still this representation of this brilliant idea that an artist had in the 1820s, 1810s, where, where whichever print you're, you're, you're picking up. Um, I also love the collective nature of the work because it is it's a the painter creates the image and then the tracer puts it onto a set of wood blocks and then a carver creates the wood and wood by the way that's been uh, chopped down cherry wood that's been chopped has been sawed has been planed to within a you know millimeter of the appropriate thickness by an expert craftsman you then got a printer who is taking paper that's made by, again, another expert craftsman. Today in Japan, um, National Living Treasure is actually a, a, a name that they give to people who are sustaining traditional Japanese practices like paper making. Um, and taking this, this expertly made washi paper, uh, printing this, uh, this beautiful uh, piece of work, and then you've got a publisher sitting over the top of it. So you have this amazing entrepreneurial set of, of people without one of whom the whole enterprise falls apart so you have to have an artist a carver a tracer a printer and a publisher all at the top of their game in order to create this process um in the, for you know the the, the shin hanger and the edo period work um and then but what I also love, and for me, my main interest is uh, actually Sasaku Hanger, because it's someone who's gone, no, 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 sod that. I'm going to do the whole thing myself. And I just find that brilliant. The hubris of someone to go, no, 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 give it here. And um, you know, there are people I really admire, like Sakino, like uh, there's an American, actually. And that's where I would start, if anyone's interested in this, is, is to start with a guy called Clifton Kahu. Uh, so he's uh, originally from Minnesota, moved to um, uh, Japan in the, the 1950s, I think. Uh, lived all the way till uh, he was uh, 78, I think, like 2007. And uh, he produced some of the most amazing um, uh, Sasako Hanga work I, I've ever seen. And it's, it's really, uh, he was based in a number of different cities, ended up uh, spending his last days in a small town called Kanazawa and had the fortune to, to visit from the areas that he used to work. Um, and he took riffs off of popular Shin Hanger, popular Sasako Hanger, popular uh, Edo period prints. Um, uh, there's actually, if you're watching this, the, the two that you're seeing on the screen is one by Clifton Caro, and on the other side is the, the famous Red Fuji. Uh, which is uh, a Hokusai print, but which is actually Red Fuji is more famous in Japan than um, uh, than the Great Wave. It's the one that everyone flocks to and looks at. If there's a Hokusai exhibition on, you know, they ignore everything else. Um, so I, that's where I, I'd start. I'd start with um, I'd start with one image. Uh, if you're interested, you type the words Japanese print into into any search engine, and and if you find something that makes you go, hang on, I kind of like that. Find out who did it and then just do a dive and and find more. And you start to get a sense of who these people were. And it's not just for me. I'm a, I'm a big fan of architectural scenes. I'm a big fan of natural scenes. But there are there's a, a history of uh, prints of uh, actors um, uh, across the last three, four hundred years. I mean, amazing historical scenes. If you're into military history, there's amazing. I mean, absolutely amazing prints done of the uh, of the Sino-Japanese War, um, of the uh, the uh, uh, Russo-Japanese War. A uh, big, big naval scenes that you just think, okay, that's you know, beautiful, it's amazing. And these are original pieces of work. These aren't reprints because people don't go back and reprint these. And these are kind of the kinds of things you can pick up for a few hundred pounds um, and just put them up on your wall. And they are, I mean, they're massive. They're usually triptiches. So they, you know, three big kind of open sized pieces of paper. Um, and there's some really, really interesting stories that go along with it as well. And so if you're interested at all in Japanese history, then it's, that's also a great starting place to say, you know, I'm interested in you, know, uh, uh, Tokugawa, for example, um, and uh, the uh, the rise of the shogun. 
or I'm interested in samurais, or I'm interested in ninja, or I'm interested, yeah, these things, and just start kind of diving, single words, and then just doing that deep dive, and you'll find some really, really amazing stuff. And if you're interested in more modern art, there's some really interesting um, Sasaku hanga, uh, which is far more modern and far more stylized, but really, I mean, just amazingly beautiful in the way in which there's a control of form and color with only three or four different different shades. So and that's where I would start. I would definitely look out a guy called Dave Bull, um, who's he's on YouTube, he's um, uh, he's on uh, Instagram, Facebook, and things like that. So he's he's doing this right now. Um, there's a number of galleries in in Japan um, uh, that uh, you could you could reach out to, and they have on their website. Some of them have English websites, which are really easy to, to navigate. Um, uh, but uh, the museums as well. Uh, the Met in New York has great collections. Um, Siebold Hoos in Leiden in the Netherlands has a massive collection. Um, there's uh, some in Colorado, Hawaii. Um, so there's lots of individual museums and universities that have them there. And then publications happen all the time. Um, and then just you know, a quick search on Amazon, you'll start to see the kinds of things and find the kinds of things that you're interested in. And then if you want to, you can start buying the books and, and seeing a little bit more of this. And then eventually maybe take a leap. And if someone, you find a, a print somewhere, you think, yeah, okay. And you start getting into it. Don't get into it too much though. Otherwise you, you'll be like me and that's it. It's, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a nerd for this. Um, and uh, I, can, I can bang on about this all day. I'm absolutely fascinated. It's a world I knew absolutely nothing about. Um, I still have barely dipped the proverbial toe, but I feel like I could hold a conversation in a bar if I had to uh, about some peripheral elements, given your, your huge knowledge of it, um, about Japanese print art. And fascinating stuff, Barry. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. Is there anything you'd like to say before we say goodbye? And uh, hopefully put this in the public domain very soon. Um, uh, the only thing I would say is history is great. And um, if you can find something that, that, that hooks you into it, um, go for it. It doesn't have to be you know, Japanese prints. It doesn't have to be you know, Asian history or European history. But there's always something that um, is out there that you think, hang on, why is that the way it is? And just, you know, I would always say go down that rabbit hole and, um, and have a dive and have a, have a rummage around. And, and you'll be utterly amazed uh, the just how brilliant people are in the past and how we got to where we are right now so um yeah just keep reading keep looking and keep your eyes out and if anyone finds um any uh, original clifton cars uh on their on the travels nab them because uh, they're worth a mint now thank you for listening to this edition of the versus history podcast Visit us at www.versushistory.com and follow us at Versus History on Twitter and Instagram. You can download all episodes from iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify or from wherever you get your podcasts.